Hey guys, I have a question for you. How do you spread abundance? This year, Joe and I are spreading even more abundance by giving out insights on money, wealth strategies, and resources in our current newsletter, Creating Abundance in 52 Weeks, that we want to share with you for free. So sign up right now as you're listening to this episode on our website at www.abundantculture.co. That's .co slash newsletter, www.abundantculture.co slash newsletter. Don't let delay get in the way of your abundant year. Now, back to the episode. Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast. Where we dissect the mindsets and tactics of the true beast of business. People like Gary V, Grant Cardone, and Warren Buffett. All to create a blueprint to experience life more abundantly. Hey guys, this week on the Abundant Culture Podcast, we're talking to one of our very, very good friends about real estate and credit because he went from just an average teacher salary to a millionaire in just one year by building up his credit, helping others do the same, and then applying that to his real estate portfolio. And we had such a long talk with him that we had to split this episode into two parts. So this week, we're talking about how he used credit to build his real estate portfolio and then the difference between business and personal credit. So get ready to listen to and learn from our very good friend, Melvin Johnson. Hey, Melvin, how's it going? We're so glad to have you here at the Abundant Culture Podcast. We were supposed to have you on for like like a long time ago. I mean, we knew you before. I think we even started the podcast, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but now we're just now getting to it. And a lot has happened over the course of starting this podcast to where we are today. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of what you do and why you do it and all those different things, tell us a little bit about your story. Like, how'd you get into business and what motivated that? Hey, well, I'm happy to be on the show. Yeah, as you know, uh, we've known each other for about two years now. So one of the things I would say that motivated me to get into uh, business in general, whether it be real estate, credit repair, or business funding, was the fact that I knew I, I had gotten to a point in my life, per se, where I knew I needed to make a decision. My wife was, my wife and I were graduating seminary, uh, grad school, and we had a small child, our daughter Joy. And the kind of degree that I went out there was more personal than it was a moneymaker degree kind of thing, one of those things. It was a master of theology is what it was. And although I, I highly value the degree, at the end of the day, like I have to make ends meet you know, some way or another. So for me, I had spent so much time throughout college just, you know, doing some personal development, some soul seeking, and also just honing in on some things that I didn't get uh, growing up that I never really dug my teeth into the actual, my actual occupation, like what it is that I wanted to do. I mean, I had things that I thought I wanted to do, whether it be nursing or, you know, business administration, psychology, uh, various things, but there was never a single thing for me that uh, throughout my entire collegiate career where I just knew this is what I want to do. Right. And that lasted all the way up until about my senior year uh, of grad school or, you know, my last term of grad school. And one day my wife and I, we were laying around the house and I was scrolling through Facebook, you know, a good friend of ours, uh, Daniel Clark, I had seen on Facebook that he had, had closed on one of his deals. This was probably November of 2016. Uh, no, 17. And I'd seen that he had closed on a deal. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, that was that's pretty neat. You know, he closed on, a, I believe, a 24 unit. And I reached out to him and I was like, man, hey, what, man, what are you doing? You know, how did you get started, in, you know, doing whatever it is that you're doing? And he was like, hey, man, you know, it's been awesome. If you can come to my office, I'll explain everything to you as to what it is that I do. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Now, Daniel had to live about three hours away from where I stayed at the time. So like most people, when confronted with a decision, they're reluctant, and then eventually they don't make a decision. And I was one of those people. Uh, I told them, strung them alone for about six months. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm coming. And uh, I'd never come. i never come and sit down with them. And then about May of 2018, he popped back up on my Facebook timeline. And he's like, hey, I officially am a multimillionaire, right? You know, I closed on a 
believe it was a 32 unit building. And I was like, okay, you know, what's the <laughs> trick? <laughs> you know, I was, you know, I was with this guy at church camp and, you know, I know him like, you know, he's pretty normal. And for me, although he was into real estate heavily, that was his, it's his primary focus. I had always thought real estate was for those kind of people, right? Not like Dave, but like other people, people yeah. that, you know, dressed up and, just had, you know, you went to a special school to go get a degree. So I would say that that's actually where I got my foot into the door. Um, he invited me to a, you know, like a, a workshop. And that's actually where, you know, you and I met at the workshop. And, you know, I was real skeptical. I was like, man, you know, tell me what's going on, man. Is this, is this really real? Is this the real deal? You know? And I remember you telling me about a deal that you and Jazz were working on at the time. It was a 12 unit building. Yeah. And I think, the guy who had spoken maybe the week before that of that workshop, he had gotten me to come back. I would say our conversation had gotten me to believe that it worked, right? You know, I was like, okay, somebody, somebody like me, you know, another African American male, my same same age, you know, similar situation in terms of trying to put his roots down and start a family. Uh, okay, that was that was you know that was enough for me. So I think yeah. that's actually you know, where I got my start, you know, my start came from, you know, various encounters, but to pinpoint it, I would say it was solidified when I came to the workshop. And then you told me that it was something that you had been doing for just a short amount of time. You hadn't been doing real estate that long up until that point, I believe maybe, maybe three or six months. Yeah. And you had already secured that kind of, you know, deal and you were looking rough. So I was like, oh man, yeah, this is, you know, we got to, <laughs> this thing must work, you know? All right. <laughs> so, but yeah, I would say that that's where, it, that's where it uh, definitely started. Absolutely. So kind of talk a little bit about from, I guess, the time you made that decision to uh, jump into this real estate thing to becoming, I feel like a lot of what you're known for now is building, you know, credit, getting people funding for businesses and different things of that nature. How did your your credit path evolve from what you were learning just in, in real estate? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, very early on, you learn in real estate that you have to have something, you know, supple- supplementing that entrepreneurship of like the career that you may be carving out because, you know, you don't start making money overnight. That's one of those things where, you know, you can raise all the capital, you can have all the deals, you know, but it takes a, it takes a few years, you know, to yeah. actually to start to begin to live off of that income solely. So I would say that was number one, but number two came by way of trial and error. I was always interested, like, I thank my mom for this every day. She didn't, she didn't butcher my credit. So I didn't have some of the challenges that some of my clients have when it comes down to, you know, even trying to start in real estate, but I didn't realize how vital it it was. But for me, you know, I grew up, you know, not extremely poor, but I didn't grow up, you know, like wealthy. So I was always trying to figure out another way, like, okay, raising capital is cool, but you know, this credit thing, you know, we were told stay away from credit cards, you don't ever deal with credit, you know, you don't ever deal with that sort of thing. But the more I, I listened to a guy speak at a workshop, and I mean, the way that he was just breaking down credit, it just blew my mind, right? It just blew my mind. But so I, I started to try different things, you know, I tried to, I started trying to do the uh, authorized user thing, I started trying to work on trade lines. And a lot of it was just junk, you know, it was a bunch of junk. And, you know, I was out of thousands of dollars and it, it, it amazes me that I can say that I was out of a thousand, thousands of dollars because when I first started, I didn't think I had any money to start with, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then when I started trying to experiment with stuff, you know, it was 10, 15, $18,000 when it was all said and done, I had blown all of it. And I was like, wait a minute, that could have been money that I did on a wholesale deal or something like that. And I don't even know where it was coming from half the time. You know, I'm so... That was a, uh, but I did that, but I had wasted all of that time. I would say about three months. And I think the last guy that had sold me on this, man, we can build your profile, right. To get you funding and it'll, it'll help you jumpstart uh, your real estate investing career. When that didn't work out, would, would, which would have been 2017, uh, it would have been around November of 2017. Uh, that's when I was like, okay, I have to learn about this obviously because there's no one to trust in this field you know and for me i i don't like not knowing something right i if i if i learn it and then it's just too time consuming or if i learn that it's too much for me 
I'm okay with letting it go. But if, if I can have an opportunity to learn it, then off, offer it as a service, then for me, you know, uh, I'll do it. And that just so happened that I was able to do it. So I took away for about six months just learning credit, learning the laws and learning uh, how it affects the business, um, how can it be beneficial to the business, the personal the same way, and how those things could be, you know, used and manipulated to help an individual, you know, to build a track record. Because I don't think any of the, the credit that initially I was trying to build, um, I don't think any of that can help you to become like, you know, super wealthy, but it can help you to establish a track record and build transactional history that a lot of times goes underrated with like banks, you know, banks want to see what have you done? And you can have all the credit in the world and not have any transactional experience and that kills you. So um, now looking back, I can say, you know, for for me, that was one of the things that it helped start. It helped me to, you know, garnish and, you know, uh, gather all of the experience that was necessary for me to be able to help individuals to improve credit and then use credit and eventually, eventually have a track record when they're able to walk up to a bank or a lender and say, hey, these are the things that I've done. And these are the kind of terms I want for borrowing your money. That's essentially, that's the, that's the primary goal for me. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much that in a nutshell. Awesome. So where were you learning like all of this credit stuff? Because, you know, there's tons of places that you can learn on. And um, I know somebody that's like obsessed with learning credit right now, but he's only looking at like YouTube videos. Like Mm. where were you learning this information from? I was paying a lot of money, to be honest, because you learn that like really quickly. It's not that YouTube isn't great because it is. It's a it's phenomenal, actually. But it's a side dish. It's not really your main court. Like it's it's like macaroni or French fries. It's like a side dish. So you need something that's more filling, more substance, if, if you will. And I think that uh, YouTube and like things like Bigger Pockets, those are the, the supplementary things that, that come alongside of your books and your paid webinars and your you know, things that, because I'm just a firm believer in principle and I don't think people value it. And myself, we don't value things that a lot of times are free until we have something, unless it's something that we're relying on for a secondary measure of like a substance. So for me, I was uh, Derek Harper senior. I was buying his material um, on credit dispute, credit repair cloud. They were, they were awesome and phenomenal and helping me to jumpstart and learning about the laws and stuff like that. Um, I was taking the NCEC uh, accreditations for, you know, how to properly dispute, how to set up, just knowing the psychology behind credit repair and finance. Yeah. I was buying other material from people on YouTube who were selling the material, you know, that I let it found out like, oh, this was just, you know, this wasn't really anything. So I spent a ton of money just learning it because I learned very quickly that that was going to help me to really get in front of the line. It's like, the, you know, when you go to Great America and, you know, some people have the flash passes and they can just walk right up to the ride. It was that sort of thing where, mm-hmm. you know, it just helped me to get there a lot, a lot faster than it would have if, if I would have been, you know, trying to, you know, Nick, Nick and Matt uh, with YouTube solely, solely. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I, I did do, I did a lot of YouTube, but then I did a lot of um, like paid, you awesome. know, and then obviously with the group, we paid twenty thousand dollars for some credit, you know, you know, education as well. So yeah. it helped. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. So a question I just had is, how did your spirituality fit into, you know, like the the whole story that you told us from getting interested in real estate to now you're building like that track record? Like, how does the spirituality in your life fit into all of that? Oh man, that's the the core for me, and you guys. You guys know, for me, that's just super uh, essential because there have been times where in real estate, I've had to have make decisions and I have solely relied on the Holy Spirit for guidance in those moments where in the natural, it would look as if, oh, that's not what you're supposed to do, but I do those things and they work out. So let me see, like my wife, it was one of those things where my aunt had prophesied to me, I would say the May, the March before we started, I started doing real estate so it had been 2018 in March and she was like yeah you'll do real estate and I was like you always tell me what I'm gonna do like you, say, oh, <laughs> you know you said I was gonna do this you said I was gonna do that and uh she's like no you're gonna do real estate and it wasn't on my radar you know it wasn't on my radar it was something that just wasn't even and lo and behold it was one of those things where I was like okay God if I'm gonna be you know coming back and forth to 
my meetups and my workshops and stuff like that. I just, you know, I need to see a sign. I'm not, I'm not trying to pressure you or put you in a corner. Not that I can, but I do need to see something. And I mean, he showed up in multiple occasions where it was, it was so evident that business in general, learning finance and credit and real estate, that it was just something that he wanted for me, for other people, you know, so that when people came and they had questions about things that, you know, I knew I was able to service them, you know, a lot of times for free. And a lot of times it was a service for them, you know, and that, yeah. that they felt as if, okay, this is, this is truly different. Something is different about this experience where, you know, I appreciate it and am willing to pay for it. So I would, I would say that it's, it, it's integral because I think one of the things that, you know, as a believer, I see a lot of times is that we just lack that understanding when it comes down to, you know, finance or, or just in general, how to play the game um, yeah. and how to uh, use the system to advance the kingdom. Uh, we put those things and we believe that they are diabolically opposed to each other. And a lot of times it's, it's just not the case, you know, it's yeah. just not the case. So without, I know you guys probably have some more questions about spirituality, so I'm going to stop there. But uh, that would probably be where I say it's the core. Without it, none of it makes sense. You know, none of it even matters without, you know, my spirituality and faith. Yeah. And it's a uh, that's a good point that you made to really tie the two together, like your spirituality with the knowledge and wisdom that you were gaining about finance and real estate and all these different type of things. I was listening to this guy the other day. His name is Jim Baker. He's like a pastor, but he also he also does something for like entrepreneurs. And he was saying how like if you want like this, this supernatural favor, the best way to get it is to kind of like have, I forgot how exactly how you worded, but he was like, um, God wants to put his super on your natural. So it's like, you should try to get your natural together. So God can really bless that with the supernatural. And I think that's what I really seen you do this entire time in business is you really married the two both together very, very well, because the rate at which you succeeded was just a lot faster than pretty much anybody I've ever seen. Like I've never seen somebody go from, you know, basically knowing nothing about investing to owning, you know, multiple, multiple pieces of real estate, raising capital and doing all the things and had a a business that uh, repairs credit, all these different things. And I think you did all of that in what, about a year and a half, two years. Yeah. super Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that's unprecedented for most people. So I knew that there was definitely, a supernatural component there because we know some people who join these uh, workshops and different things of that nature and they'll be there for like five you know eight years and you know they haven't done a single thing so I think that was amazing another question that um I was really wondering about is where we're talking about credit for our viewers and listeners who may not necessarily know there is a business and a personal credit. And I kind of wanted you to touch on the, the main differences uh, between business and personal credit to kind of inform people who may think that there's only a such thing as personal credit. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, to backtrack a little bit, to God be the glory, man. Uh, truly, that is, I, that's an, a testament to his faithfulness and, you know, his call, um, because I, it wasn't something that I even thought that I could do. And because it was something that he had in, in alignment with my life. It just worked out. It worked out. It had no other choice. So, yeah. but uh, in regards to like business and personal credit, yeah. The, I, and it's funny because that is always, it's forever developing with me, right? Because most things in life are just situational. You know, there are very few absolutes, I believe in regards to like, it should be done this way every single time. Right. And if you would have asked me that last year, I would have told you what a different thing between yeah. business, you know, business and personal. But now, one of the biggest difference that that I'm seeing a lot is, uh, and this is because of the data, is um, like one of the things I like to highlight is the utilization. Um, you know, on the personal side of credit, your utilization weighs in so much heavier than it does on determining what your business credit score is. So, like on the business side, your utilization. The personal side, your utilization is it determines 30% of your credit score, your your FICO. That's a huge difference. So, you know, if it was on a scale to 100, it would determine, you know, you would 30 points of it would go out of the window if you maxed out your credit card that month, you know. And, you know, if you just put that on a grander scale of 550 points that you're trying to make up because you start out with a 300, okay, 350, 300, depending on the person, and you have to make up 550 points. 
right? To get to an 850, that's the minimum and that's the, that's the highest. I've not seen anybody, anyone personally have lower than that. Um, I've seen no credit. I've not seen anything lower than 300 and it, cause it doesn't exist, but surprise me. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, that's the bare minimum. And utilization is one of the heavier things now in the business. It doesn't really matter as much, right? Because that's not something that's, that's heavily reported. The th one thing that, um, business credit bureaus want to see Dun and Brad, um, Equifax, TransUnion has a business. These things, they want to make sure that you are uh, making payment. So if I lend you my money, can I get my payments on time? Because they function very much like personal lending institutions, right? They make money on the interest. However, it's more important on a business side because the business functions very differently than the personal. See, on the personal, you have things like the CFPB that will regulate and, you know, sort of come in and facilitate uh, exchange between a business and a consumer on the business the business side is not there's really like no management you don't really have that and if you, you are not prepared or if the company isn't prepared to you know go to court a lot of times that stuff can be costly and a lot of times they just wait they'll just wash their hands with it because it's not it's not worth it and what they're going to have to spend in court now me if i had an issue with walmart and i felt like they wronged me i can file a complaint to the ftc i can file a complaint to the cfpb which is the consumer protection bureau that protects us. Um, I can file with those companies and I can let them sort of handle issues for me that may or may not get resolved. But if they don't get resolved, then I can further pursue with my own personal legal team and then I can go after them on the business is not so. Payment history is that much important because on the business than it is on the personal, although it accounts for 35% of your personal FICO, it's almost like it drops off the list of utilization almost drops off the list on the, the business side. And it's easier to get credit limit increases on the business side than it is the personal. Uh, depending on who you go with, not Capital One, uh, <laughs> you know, those, if you get a business credit card, it doesn't report on your personal FICO, right? Or your personal credit score, it doesn't. So every little thing isn't really hurting you. You get penalized a lot on the personal side of credit just yeah. because you just do uh, whoever developed the system, whenever they developed it, it they, they just develop. And I guess it's no different than you and I, you know, if I lent you money and we were a part of community and you didn't pay me back, I'm probably going to blast you to the community mm -hmm. as well, you know, yeah. but on the business side, I can go hide behind a lot of entities. So, you know, it's very hard for Joseph to change the way he looks I mean, unless he is w willing to undergo some excruciating pain, like pouring hot grease on your face to disfigure you in some way. You know, but on the business side, it's it's very easy. You can hide behind multiple LLCs, especially when you're not the personal guarantor. If you build up businesses strong enough, those businesses can individually or solely uh, exist on their own and also develop their own credit. So it, there's just so many more perks. There's so much. There's so much more you can do on the the business side if you actually have a legitimate business that's growing. Right. Not just to be creating LLCs and they're not really be going anywhere. But if your business really is, you know, bringing in revenue, revenue, not necessarily profits, but revenue. If they're bringing in revenue, you know, then you can apply for something called revenue based lending. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, I don't have a lot of profits. Well, there's just so much you can do. Revenue based lending. You can do asset based lending or equipment financing. You could do, you know, business credit or loans that is backed by the personal. I mean, it's just so much. But on the personal side, it's just it's just you. You know, you can go get a co-signer, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's just you and everything falls back on you. And if it messes up, you know, you have to file bankruptcy or, you know, you have to foreclose on your house and that's going to mess with you for seven to 10 years. And it almost, in some regard, forces you to become an entrepreneur because, you know, one of the great things about, I think, you know, being an entrepreneur is that you don't have to rely on yourself. Yeah. You know, you don't. And a lot of times that's when people perform best when they are not their number one option. You know, they're their greatest value and greatest resource. But they're not their number one option as it relates to um, how they're going to make ends meet for their immediate situation. You know, they have to go out and make themselves presentable. And a lot of times that's when you see the dog come out of people and they just do things like, man, that ain't, that you, that's unprecedented, as you mentioned earlier. So <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be just the, the two different, like a few differences between business credit and personal credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how would somebody start to build up, I guess, um, their personal credit and how would somebody go about, I guess, building their, their business credit? Yep. So the number one thing would be uh, 
you know, that changes every day too, just because um, maturity level, it depends on a lot of like how much success you have with, with credit. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to say that probably from here on the rest of my life, it just really d- does depend. If you give credit to, you know, you give $20,000 to a 21 year old who, who's never had responsibility in his life. And actually let's, let's flip that. If you give it, you give that to a 36 year old person who has never had responsibility really ever in their life. No kids. Um, they've always kind of been in their own lane, lane, and, you know, but if they, they got excited and well, we're about to do it. And then they come in, you know, you, you guys are coaching them. And then you guys say, Hey, we know a guy who can help you get obtain credit. And, you know, we help them obtain credit. And that person is, you know, they've never had responsibility. A lot of times they're going to, they're just going to, they're going to blow through that money. Um, yeah. It's just, they're going to blow through their credit because what they're going to assume is because they've been extended the credit, the credit is therefore theirs. And that's not the case. You know, um, I never, you know, I'm, I'm to a point now where I tell people don't apply for funding if you don't have um, some kind of plan as to how you're going to use it. And also use that money to make money for you. If you don't have that, just wait, because you're doing a few things. You're, you know, you're wasting, the introductory period where well, a person might come and say, well, but I'm building the longevity behind payment history. You know, that's one of the things that helps me. And it does, it, it does help, but that's for the person who, who isn't going to networking events, who's not trying to raise capital and stuff like that. That only applies to the everyday common person who's trying to build credit to go do something like just buy a house and, you know, okay, we're working at their job that they're working at and not really trying to um, achieve like, things that would demand that of their credit, right? So yeah. I would say that that's for that, that particular individual. For anyone that's trying to be like an entrepreneur, I would say, wait, because you don't want to waste that introductory period. You go, you're going to be responsible because you're going to learn more about credit in the time that you're waiting to apply for credit. So you're going to learn more about credit. You're going to be much more knowledgeable and you're going to figure out possibly how not to even use your own credit and use somebody else's credit to do deals and do a service to them. So um, not, not rush to do what's for me. I mean, I was doing business credit and real estate over a year and a half before I had, I got personal credit cards and stuff like that. I had one credit card because I of one of the workshops that we went to and I, and I built that credit limit up from 2000 to 7,500 at that particular time. I just built it up, right? Because I knew if I had more credit cards, I was going to spend more for one because the statistics prove that when you have more money, you spend more money, you know? So I'm going to spend more. I might be more tempted to look for opportunity where opportunity isn't present. And uh, so I just, I just don't recommend it. So uh, for a person that's looking to start to bring it back around, that's looking to start um, building personal credit, I would say, you know, I would ask them just several questions, you know, how much do you know about personal credit? What are your intentions for the credit that you're looking to obtain? And are you ready? Right? You know, yeah. that's, that would essentially be it. So, um, and if those questions are answered, the thing that you can do to build credit, obviously, is opening up a an account of, of any sort, whether that be a small personal loan, like a self lender account, which I'm a huge advocate of for individuals looking to rebuild their credit, not necessarily build their credit because self lender uh, loans, those only last for a year. So there's really no point in building an account for a year that's going to close and shrinking your average years of history. Yeah. Uh, so to me, they don't work for individuals trying to build credit more so than they do people that are trying to kind of start. Know, kind of start so um, but self lender accounts for the person looking to rebuild for the person that's looking to build just opening up a regular account you know unsecured credit card or a a loan of some sort that can ex- that can be paid back reasonably within you know three to five years depending on the financial you know financial statements that they provide something like that because those do help because you need a mix uh, you need a variety of credit for you to actually have a strong credit score so maybe a cell phone bill a light bill something like that, you know, because it demonstrates to the lender that you are a responsible borrower because you've been responsible in some of the uh, day-to-day activities and day-to-day obligations that you have as an individual. So we'll take a chance on lending to you because that's really all lending is. It's just a chance for a person to make their money. 
Yeah. You know, it's not really even to better their situation. Should we give you a chance to make us money? You know, that's that's what it is. So um, th- that would be another thing, you know. So self-lender, opening up a, you know, maybe a small credit card, secure, unsecured, have, or uh, secured for the person that's looking to rebuild is a great option because you can give money and then after a certain amount of time, they'll give you your money back, turn it into an unsecured card. And then it's also an awesome way to build payment history um, because that's, you know, that's the highest on a uh, FICO. You know, it, it composes of most of the score. Um, so I believe it's 192 and a half points that it, it, that it comprises of. So something like that and not missing payments, you know, which is why if I had an individual who, who just said, man, I just cannot wait. You know, I just, I hear what you're saying. I'm looking to get started right now. I don't want to do real estate for another two years, but because of what you're telling me, I'm going to learn during that period or a year. That's probably an exaggeration, but a year. I, I don't want to do real estate. I don't want to do credit repair. I don't want to own this auto shop or barber shop or, you know, coffee shop, whatever it may be, but I want to build my credit. Okay. So I'd start them off with the smallest credit limit that you possibly can. And the reason why I would do that is because you can build a relationship, whatever institution that is, whether it be Chase, MX, Discover, um, whoever it is, you, you're building a relationship with them and it is starting off very small. And there's, there's less of a, a fall with a small, smaller credit limit. You know, there's not, it's not that big. And a lot of times you're only paying 1% of uh, the total amount of either the balance or whatever the card is. So I know your minimum payments are going to be low, even if you had interest packed on it. So I'm th- the psychology behind what I'm thinking about and how I'm not only thinking about getting the person funded, but is this the best situation, let's say eight months from now and, you know, they lose their job, you know, yeah. can six months of savings cover their credit card bill, even if they're only paying the minimum till they find another job, those kind of things. So, so those would be, that would be definitely what I would suggest to the new person, opening up a small credit card um, to open it up to um, with two different lenders and building those and just making sure that you're making at least the minimum payments every month. You know, every month. And then um, I guess the follow up to that question will be like when you on the personal side, when you're paying off these credit cards um, and you're trying to get the balance down, I've heard that you should keep like 1% on there or some people say you should just pay it completely off. Like what is there a one truth behind that or does it depend on the person or what's your take? Well, when you call and you know, I, I heard the same thing. So when I first started out in credit repair, I was telling people five different things every week. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, it's not good. And I didn't have any facts behind it. But a lot of times we regurgitate what it is that we hear from authority figures that we see to be authoritative. Yeah. So for me, I just I was like regurgitating. So when I start calling in, I was like, hey, is it oh, do I need to keep like a percentage on here? You know, that's all you have to do, really. You know, it's just it's like, uh, no. I mean, you, we prefer you pay it off, but if you don't, you know, just make the minimum payment. So again, that's speculative. I don't know. I have not seen in concrete any bank or lending institution be upset with you for paying off their balance in full every month. I've not seen it. And But I've only been, in humility, I've only been doing, you know, credit for two years, a little bit. Yeah, about a year now, a little over a year now. So I haven't done it very long in terms of just ingratiating myself into the business of, you know, so I've not seen them reduce a limit because of it. Uh, and if there are any, anyone listening or watching this and they have had experienced that, please reach out, let me, Jazz and Joe know, and you know, that'll shape my perspective from there, but I've not seen it. And typically I try to stay, if I can, between one and 3%, because although I've not heard from the lending institutions that they, you know, that they prefer to keep your balance down, it's just because of all the people that told me, I'm like, oh, okay, then one in three, I feel like that's a good rule, you know, <laughs> that's a good rule to let them know that I'm actually using the credit because they only want to give you credit. It's weird. They don't want to lend to people who need it. They want to lend to people who really don't need it. But if they see that you don't need it, if what I'm hearing is true, that they'll sort of take some type of action against you because it yeah. because it's not paid, then that'd be weird. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so to to kind of comment on that, I think, and like you work with credit way more than I do, but the the reasoning that I've heard was that the, and it kind of goes along with what you're saying, but the reasoning that I've heard about the the whole one to 3% thing 
is that what the the bank's mentality is that one to three percent usually i mean if you're if you're going to default on something it's probably not something that you only have a one to three percent utilization on Mm -hmm. but also like from their mentality it's like a a safe way to profit in a way because Mm -hmm. i mean if the if you're not using the car you're not paying interest you're not probably not paying fees either so they're not profiting so I guess they kind of get the best of both worlds because it's only one to three percent. So it's a low likelihood of default, but also it's one to three percent. So they're still collecting interest and fees off of the one and three percent. So it's kind of like they're getting their profit, but they're also kind of staying safe. So that's kind of the way that I was kind of thinking about it. And I did hear that after a while, if you don't use, I I forgot who I talked to, but they like they weren't using this this credit line that they had. Mm-hmm. And the bank basically like closed it, and I didn't. I think you told us about that. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, I told you. I was. I had one car, and I had like a couple that I wasn't using. Right, you know, I was just like, okay, these were they were okay cars. I didn't think they. And uh, who was it? It was uh, Barclay. <laughs> they just sent a letter in the mail. It was like, hey, and it was not even six months. You know, I thought, oh, it just. And they were like, oh, we're gonna close this this car down because you know you and they cite it yeah you don't need it you, you, you're using the other cars and I was just like man so that was out of all the cars because I think I got I had like seven and I think that that's when they closed that one down and I was like oh they, they really do do that yeah they ain't playing with <laughs> you <laughs> no they're not no, they're they're like give us our money back <laughs> right yeah so I do know inactivity that will get a, a, an account closed for sure because like you said they're not you know they you're not really making them money but that i you know and i'm still confused i mean i guess they closed it because they <laughs> wasn't using it but my wife had a car she wasn't using it she just activated it last week got it in november and i was like this car i didn't even know if the car was still on or not and it was still on so yeah mm-hmm. well maybe when it's like not activated maybe they don't necessarily like set that money aside yet mm-hmm. because it's not activated mm-hmm. it's just a, a guess that i have i, I mean i don't have any evidence behind that but yeah credit credit's one of those really weird things that is mm-hmm. it's, it's like when somebody explains it to you it makes sense but there's like small nuances and rules where it's like yeah. everybody it, it kind of moves from you know place to place like we were supposed to be getting funding like on like a few uh business credit cards right now and just because everything that's going on like uh, what we found, I think it was American Express. Mm-hmm. Like they're lending we money easily. We were gonna get like thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> but but they 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 given they given pennies though. So it's like we like they they we kind of like pre approved for like ten different American Express cards, and it was like oh this is dope. But uh-huh. like when you actually get one, they're like oh we'll, we'll give you. Two grand. Right. It's like thousand yeah. dollars. What is that? Like, that's that. That's that blue cash. That is blue. That's what they, they hit my wife with it. She was like, "Oh yeah, you can just tell them to cut it off." I was like, "Girl, you better build that account." Right. <laughs> For sure. No, you're so, right about that. Have you um, seen any changes then, um, like working with your clients or yourself, or like um, between you and your wife with? the stimulus package like once that hit have you seen changes in the credit oh absolutely yeah so recently i actually went under a financial review with american express yeah they reached out to me and it was probably primarily because of something that i had done but it was something that i had done before and you know they just reached out and they were like hey we don't know if you're struggling in your business so we're gonna do a financial review on you so give us like two month bank statements of everything and you know, if they meet our requirement, we won't cut these cars off. And I was like, what? So I was like, I called in. I was like, is this serious? <laughs> y'all, you, y'all, y'all serious? <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah, we're serious. So, is it, this you know, is stick up. <laughs> right. I was like, you know, so in my mind, I'm like, how much I tell y'all? No, let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you I'm in a half a million or a millionaire yet? Okay, I, okay. No, but I was like, uh, no, but so they did a financial review on me within like, like I really say two weeks ago. And uh, because I don't use one of the cards, they dropped one of the limits, but they kept everything. They actually raised one limit on one card. They kept one the same. They lowered the one that I wasn't using. And then they, inc- well, they say they increased it, but it, one of the, my, the business, uh, the gold card, it just stayed the same. I was like, I, that was the limit before you guys 
even <laughs> did this review. So yeah, no, they did a review on me for sure. And you know, those financials, I got tell people, you know, is and that's the revenue. See, the revenue saved me in that case, you know, and well, it didn't save me, but it confirmed what it is that I had already known is that the revenue that was coming into the business is actually what they they're concerned with. You know, they were concerned with, okay, how much is this business making okay. a year? You know, so you know, I, they were like a hundred thousand dollars coming to account but it's, you only have like 10 left at the end of the month, you know, because you're maintaining the business, you know, so things, you know, but if they can see that coming in and then, you know, coming out and that, I guess two months was good enough for them. Typically they can go back longer than that. You know, they can go back six months or, you know, they can go, they can go back as long as they want to, you know, that's the thing. But usually they do, they'll do a two month, uh, depending on like what the charge was or what alerted them to do that. Like if something, like if you tried to, like one of the things that I, so I own a construction company now. So my, one of my partners who's actually an employee of the corporation, he's actually, he's his own, like he, he functioned like a sole prop, but he's actually being integrated more into this company. So, cause he has to understand that I have to give you a W9 and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Cause you work for this, this company now. So I was paying him for installing our windows on our house. But what I did was I used my credit card to pay him through Square. So Square will send you a 1099 at the end of the year. And I was using my credit card to pay him. And that just, that triggered them. So they thought I was trying to get money off of the card because Mm -hmm. in times like this, that's what people are doing. People are doing cash advances. They're invoicing themselves. You know, they're doing everything, you know. So they were like, yeah. So I called and they were like, you know, usually we can just cut the card off. You know, we can cut the card off and that'd just be the end of it. But, you know, we saw that x y and z and so they just said you know we don't allow they don't allow for you to even play you know you'd even pay a company that you have interest in so Dang. so don't do that yeah man they debo noted they debo. <laughs> yeah. don't do that yeah, yeah that and, and that. I, <laughs> I that's such a it's hard to even call it a mistake because i mean there there would be times and like if you own multiple businesses where that yeah. actually makes sense so like yeah. when you said that like i was like coffee shop that's what you we'll know, do. You can be paying, you know, for something else. Yeah, like. That's something we would definitely do. So no, don't, do yeah. don't, don't do it. Don't do it. So that's all we have for today, folks. I hope you got as much value out of this as we did. Keep in mind, the only way we can improve is through constructive feedback. So remember to rate and review this episode. Also, you are not the only person that needs to know this super valuable information. So be sure to subscribe and share as well. Stay tuned for the next episode. And remember to always spread abundance. Peace.